Welcome and good evening, everyone, to our webinar series tonight, the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project webinar series, hosted by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. I'm your moderator. I'm Dr. Marnie Peterson. I'd like to say a special good evening. Buenas noches and bu boi noche to our Latin American colleagues that are joining us. The title of our webinar series, our, our webinar title tonight is Antimicrobial Resistance in the Times of COVID. And we're so excited tonight to have Dr. Sylvia Costa and Dr. Maria Virginia Vijegas. Sylvia, Dr. Costa is from Brazil and Dr. Vijegas from Colombia. And the webinar they have planned for you tonight is so informative and so important for all of us to listen and, and pay attention to tonight. So I welcome them and we'll be introducing each of them individually as we proceed with the webinar. Before their presentations, I have a few slides to give you all a little bit of background about our webinar tonight. The learning objectives. There's four of them. First, we will be describing the prevalence of drug-resistant bacteria, including ESBLs, CREs, and new resistant strains within the Latin American region. We will be identifying the therapeutic option most suitable to treat ESBLs, CREs, in Latin America. We will describe the impact of COVID-19 on healthcare-associated infections and on rates of antimicrobial resi resistance in Latin America. And finally, apply and uphold core components of antimicrobial stewardship programs while working on COVID response efforts. So very exciting and a lot of ground to cover tonight. This webinar also has continuing education that will be provided at the end, both for pharmacy, ACPE, as well as for physicians, a, um, ACCME. So after this webinar, I will be giving you some more information about where you can get your code, and where you can go to take your test. The funding tonight for this webinar is provided and supported by an educational grant from Biomario. And we're very grateful for their support to bring this information and educational material to you. My final two final slides, disclosures. For those of us that planned from SIDRAP and those of us speaking tonight, no relevant conflict of interest to report. Dr. Bajegas did um, report that she had received consulting fees from both Merck and Pfizer in the past. And finally, and this information will be presented at the end again, for your self-assessment to receive your continuing educations, our provider is ProCE, so you will be going to their website, their www.proce.com. You need to go there by December 25th of this year to take your post-test and receive and claim your credit. The code that you will need will be provided at the end. All right, so it's time to begin. Part one, epidemiology and therapeutic options for multidrug resistant organisms in Latin America in times of COVID-19. This will be presented by Maria Virginia Vijegas. She's a physician, infectious diseases expert, associate professor and scientific director from gram-negative and hospital epidemiology area of research. Dr. Bajegas. Thank you. Okay, Marnie, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, to Sylvia and to, to be my co-talk co speaker and to Sidra for putting all this thing together. So I'm going to talk about the epidemiology and therapeutic options of minority drug resistant organisms in Latin America in times of COVID. And you will see why is that important. So what challenges may Latin America face during the COVID pandemic regarding gram-negative infections? So one of the things you have to remember is what should we expect? And then, of course, coronavirus arose a time of great, great concern about antimicrobial resistance. There is still limited data although Sylvia is going to present us something very interesting, limited data from K-series is reasonable to anticipate that really we'll have a minority of patients with severe COVID-19 that will have super infections. Those patients 
are going to get really the infection when they are hospitalized for a long time in the ICU or in wards. And then you have to expect that your local epidemiology is really the one that is going to take on the patient. So if you have a lot of KPCs, as I'm going to show you in Latin America, then you may expect KPCs to cause infections or ESBOs or multidrug resistant pseudomonas. So the problem is that we're going to be using broad spectrum antibiotics, but hopefully not in a very early time before the patient gets infected. So then, Dr. Vijegas, yes. Dr. Vijegas, yes. I just want uh, if you could share your slides. That really, I thought see. I was sharing my slides. <laughs> Wait. That's okay. What yes, about we're transitioning from no? my slides to yours? Can you see it now? Can you see the slides? Uh, not it, not yet. Wow, but it were, we were, the first time I shared them, uh, maybe I have to go back and say that I have to share my, wait, the screen, that thing would be that you can do that for us. Because it says that if I can show the camera with, no, share, maybe this one. Uh -huh. Um. We did it so good before. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, let me see. Chad, that I can, what about here, no? No, nothing? Would you like me to go ahead and share mine yes. and then we can please. just move from your first yes, slide? Please. Okay. Let's do that because I was, we okay. fail. I fail in my intention That's to okay. do that. Okay. okay, so we were just starting. Are you showing my slides now? I, yes. I'll start with your, um, I'll start with your first slide. Perfect. Then you can go to the second one, then the next one. So I was saying that actually what you have to expect when a patient is hospitalized with COVID-19 is the local epidemiology that you have in your hospital. So please try not to start with very broad spectrum antibiotics as soon as the patient comes from the community because that patient is going to get really infected due to the long time he's going to be in wards or in the intensive care unit. And then you have to expect what I'm going to show you. Please, the next one. Okay, so let's talk a little bit of ESBOs in Latin America. The first report of a standard spectrum beta lactamase was in Buenos Aires in 1982, and it was a Klebsiella pneumoniae who had a SHIP-5, which is actually an ESBO in a patient with urinary tract infection. Then during the times between 1987 to 1989, then we have Klebsiella pneumoniae had all the SHIPs that you want from SHIP-5 and SHIP-2, and were the cause of outbreaks in the ICUs in Buenos Aires. Then it was a big importance shift, actually, because Klebsiella's were in the hospital. But then what happened was that Tuberia scorbata, who is a bacteria from the soil outside the hospitals, gave the genes to E. coli, and that was CTXM, and that was the third line of ESBL. So we have shifts, especially in Klebsiella. We have TEMS, especially in E. coli, and then we move to CTXM, and that's why you're expecting E. coli coming from the community, causing urinary tract infections in patients not even previously hospitalized with ESBOs. So with CTXM types, what happened was that we moved the ESBOs from out of the hospital to the community. So can we move to the next one, please? So I can show you there are different data, and the, the point is that not all the, the, the countries have the same data and the same reports, but from these, you can see that actually we in Klebsiella is actually the number one bacteria that carries these plasmids that allow Klebsiella to produce these extended spectrum beta lactamases. So as you can see, it can go from 44 in blood, respiratory, skin, to 38 in abdominal, to 53 in, a, in the century study, also in blood and skin. So as you, I can show you in the next slides, we have high rates of ESBOs in Latin America, especially in Klebsiella pneumonia. So this is a, a, actually a, a, a publication from Manuel Guzman uh, that we all participated. It's from 
2014, unfortunately, but you can see that according to the countries, you can have different rates of ESBOs, very high in Mexico, and I know that's true, also very high in, in, in Ecuador, and more or less in Colombia, we have around 40%, I will show you, 30% I will show you. And in Brazil, interesting, it's rising, but probably carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae is the main problem. So there's a lot of difference according to the different countries. Let's go to the next one. So E. coli resistant rates in yes, no, Klebsiella, that was E. coli, produces in Latin America also. There's a big thing. I can say that the countries that have mostly SPOs is Central America, especially Mexico. You can see from third generation. Look that carbapenem resistant is not so high, although I'm going to talk about carbapenem resistant lately. But then you see how Klebsiella goes up in Brazil, which was in contrast to what happened with E. coli. Also, you can see Peru, high rate, 70%. You can see Argentina, 46%, and even you can see Chile with high rates of ESBLs in Klebsiella pneumonia. Next one, please. Okay, so if I can do a summary of the ESBL prevalence, I can say that according to surveillance program, you can see the SMART around 27% in E. coli, test 24%, and it goes differently for each country from 51% and 46 in Mexico, in Central America, to Peru being the third one in, in, in Latin America. You have a little bit of, of, of Ecuador, and actually Colombia didn't have the surveillance, but from the network that I have, and now are 35 hospitals in 14 cities in the country, you can have around 23%. And if you go to Klebsiella, it's even, hard, it's even higher. SMART says 38%, TES says 44%. Peru being the number one in Klebsiella pneumonia, followed by Guatemala, Brazil, Chile, and Colombia. Next one, please. So we have very high rates of ESBLs in E. coli, but more in Klebsiella. So what about therapeutic options for ESBLs? So you have to remember in severe infections and septic shock, carbapenems are still the drug of choice. Marrow one gram Q8 hours, and then when the patient is stable, and you have a culture in your hand, you can de-escalate to ertapenem. So ertapenem is not the first choice for septic shock or very septic patients. Meropenem is the one, but then you can go ahead and de-escalate. If you're thinking about bacteremia, no septic shock, and lung, you can use ertapenem one gram a day. But if you think of skin and soft tissue infections or intraperitoneal infections, maybe you can skip ertapenem and you can go to tigacycline also with a loading dose of 100 milligrams and then 50 milligrams every 12 hours. If you are thinking about urinary tractions, urinary infections, ertapenem is, is the choice because remember tigacycline, you don't have high concentrations in the urine, so you cannot use it. Sometimes you may use ciprofloxacin when you have a very low MIC. You can use phosphomycin also, especially if you have urinary tract infections, complications, complicated. You can use around four to six grams every eight hours. And especially, there's only one study with monotherapy, but I think it works because you have high concentration in your urine, never in shock. There are not really enough clinical studies. And amikacin may be used in very selective situations when the patient cannot have other medications. Let's go to the next one. And you don't have a renal failure. Let's move now to the epidemiology of carbapenem resistant enterobacteriales or enterobacteriaceae, now called enterobacteriales in Latin America. Let's move to the next one, please. Then in 2005, we were the first one, our group, really to report the first uh, ESBO, the carbapenem resistance, sorry, and was a KPC2 producing Klebsiella pneumonia. And then we saw there was a huge dissemination of KPCs in the country. In 2008, we reported also an outbreak of KPC3 producing Klebsiella pneumonia. And we thought that was because a patient from Israel came for a liver transplant. Several years later, with the whole genome sequencing, we were able to show that this patient was not really the index patient of the KPC3 arrival in Colombia, and that KPC3 was one year before already in our country. In 2006, KPC2 was reported then in Argentina, was reported in Brazil, ST258 was the clone that caused endemic dissemination, I would say in Argentina, in Brazil, and in most of the countries in Latin America. 
And then it was also reported in Venezuela, Chile, Ecuador, Peru, Uruguay, Mexico, and the Caribbean. Next one, please. So, one of the things that are very interesting in the history uh, of how they disseminate. So, there's a lot going on with clonal expansion, and we believe that that's what is causing the dissemination in Latin America and most of the countries. Overall, the spread of SP258 in Klebsiella, producing KPC, is an argument in favor of the clonal expansion since SP258 is considered a high risk international clone. Whenever it gets to the country and it's coming with KPC, you can expect a huge dissemination. But there's something interesting in this clone. It can carry KPC2, which is very promiscuous, and we published something about that. So it goes to every enterobacterial and it jumps the plasmid. Instead, this one, ST258B, is a clay 2, which tends to carry KPC3, and KPC3 usually is in the same bacteria, Klebsiella, Klebsiella, Klebsiella. So you have to, to think about different approach to this problem. One would be with antimicrobial stewardship to start to stop actually creating a selective pressure on the plasmid to jump to other enterobacteriales. The, the other one, KPC3, can be an infection control problem. So there are events of recombination and transfer of mobile genetic elements while spreading from person to person. So there's a horizontal spread through plasmid causing outbreaks, and you can have outbreaks just by plasmid when you see increase of meropen resistance in every enterobacteria. And in this case, we had a report with Laura in Colombia that showed what I told you. The KPC was clonal over the years, while KPC2 was in plasmids and fully promiscuous. Therefore, you can have, you may have to use different strategies to stop the dissemination of KPC. Next one, please. So, what is the prevalence in general of CRE in Latin America? Look at E. coli. It's not a CRE bacteria, really. It doesn't have very often this plasmid. Instead, Klebsiella pneumonia, again, as with ESBOs, is the number one bacteria. Moving from prime to 30% to 29%, less in Panama, maybe it's higher now. Next one. And if you can see, you can have high rates again in Klebsiella pneumonia. So it's a common thing that Klebsiella is the number one CRE producer, carbapenemase producer, enterobacterial. Next one, please. Let's talk a little bit about resistance and appearance of new carbapenemases, which are in the rice in Latin America. Please, the next one. And this was a study that we recently, an article that we recently reported in 2020, in August, where we made a big search of what was going on on these Latin American countries. And if you and you can see, class A mainly is KTC everywhere. Now, every country in Latin America almost has reported KPC in dissemination. Next one. Then we have class B, which is mainly metal over lactamases. And if you can choose from all of these that we have here, all of the ones who have been reported in the rest of the world, you can say that mainly we have NDMs is the number one metal over lactamase followed by some beams, especially in Pseudomona aeruginosa. And if you can choose a an area of Latin America where it was discovered and reported for the first time, and they're still predominant, is actually Central America with Guatemala, Mexico, and Honduras. Next one, please. And we have less of place class D, which is OXA 48. There's more in the Europe area, but we have reported it everywhere, as you can see, but actually OXA 48 is the real carbapenemase that you can expect. Next one. So, what are the therapeutic options for carbapenemases for KPC? Is ceftacidima bipactan? Bipactan is actually the drug of choice because it has a really very good activity against KPC. Of course, the epidemiology of each hospital will define whether it could be initiated as empirical therapy in ICU when there's a high prevalence of KPC, CSBLs, and OXA with pseudomonas aeruginosa which you always have to take into account in the ICU, and it should be susceptible to ceftacidine, cefepime, or you can screen pseudomona with ceftacidine or bactam, and if that pseudomona is susceptible, which it should be in most of the times, then you can start empirically with ceftacidine, maybe bactam. 
Also, although one thing that you have to take into account is the large inoculums that could not be trained and prolong therapy, you may consider adding another antibiotic just to protect ceftacidine and bivacan from selecting resistance from KPCs. But that's a consensus. There's no proven study about that, but we tend to do that. For OXA48, there's a recent publication that you can see there. Aceptacidine is the drug of choice. There's no other evidence with any other antibiotic, even though cefepime and ceftacidine look susceptible. Ceftacidine and Bactan has a good study that proves it should be used. For metal beta lactamases, we're in trouble. We're still in trouble. There's a recent study reported for Enterobacteralis, not for Sodomona, when they prove that ceftacidine and Bactan plus astronam is the combination therapy for Enterobacteralis with metal beta lactamases. Most of them were NDMs, but they also saw, have some beams. For Pseudomona, it may need adding another agent such as meropenem or tigacycline or polymyxin or postomycin, depending how sick the patient is. The patient is stable, I will go ahead and use ceftacidine and bifactan plus astronaut. Next, please. Now, moving for the last part of my talk with epidemiology of Pseudomona rubinosa in Latin America. Let's go to the next one. There's less information about carbapenemases in Pseudomonas rubinosa because it's much more difficult to find them. You, have, you need molecular tests to do that. But I'm going to talk about Pseudomonas rubinosa carbapenem resistant. That, that doesn't mean our, our carbapenemase producer. It may just be OPRD closure plus efflux, and that Pseudomona may become resistant to carbapenems and still could be susceptible to cefepime, ceftacidine, piptazo. So remember that. But the marker that I'm going to talk is Pseudomona carbapenem resistant. So Labarca was the last one to publish something, and it said that the carbapenem resistant Pseudomona may go up to 66% in Latin America. There are several outbreaks, like this one, SPM1 of carbapenemases found in Brazil and reported. In the rest of the Latin America, from the scare reports that we have, BIM is the number one, which is a metal of beta lactamase. Each country, of course, has a different behavior regarding Pseudomona resistant rates. However, it could be said that countries with higher rates of ESBLs, what do they use? Carbapenems. So you can expect more pseudomonas carbapenem resistant. Next one, please. So this uh, percentage of multidrug resistance and the money for regions of the world, 20 years of the century surveillance, this uh, bar that is dark blue, you can see it's always Latin America the number one compared to any other country. And the last report was 2016. And you can clearly see that Latin America has the highest prevalence of carbapenem resistance of the monarchinosa. Next one. So in summary, of the prevalence of carbapenem resistance of the monarchinosa in Latin America, I took the century, which may be different from the Atlas, but you can see Peru, 39, Panama, 33, Argentina, 26, Colombia is right here, 24, 27, and all the other countries, so it's above 20%. And in the Atlas, up to 2018, we have Chile first, behind Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Panama. So it may change a little bit, according to the reports, but in general terms, our resistance rates are higher than 30%, which in theory is expected. So it's much higher than the expected resistance of pseudomonary genosis. Next one. So what about the new choices for Pseudomonas rejuvenosa, the new antibiotics that we have in Latin America, Ceftacidine, Bactan, or Ceftalosome, Tazobactan? So to make the decision, the treatment of Pseudomonas requires really an understanding of the local epidemiology. You have to stratify the infection to know how much risk you want to run when a patient is really sick or is more stable. And you have to add the risk factors for the patient to have a pseudomonas rejuvenosa multidrug resistant or extremely drug resistant causing the infection. So according to that, you make, make you just make the decision which is the right antibiotic. So in the case of ceftacidine, mabibactan, and ceftalosome tazobactan, both are the most active antibiotics for multidrug, extremely drug resistant pseudomonas that we have available. So in the case of ceftacidine, mabibactan, remember that is the abibactan that has a really good activity about, against ESBOs and C, KPCs and OXA, protecting ceftacidine from hemolysis, and ceftacidine per se is a very good antibiotic for pseudomona. But abibactan protects ceftacidine against these carbapenemases, ESBOs, and AMC. 
So in pseudomonas aeruginosas, as I told you, producing metalobera lactonases, astronam could be added if there's a severe infection, probably at a second age. In the case of cephalosome tasobactam, cephalosome per se or itself has a very good activity. Probably is the number one antibiotic with a higher activity against pseudomonas aeruginosa. But tasobactam doesn't protect completely cephalosome against CSBOs or the repressed AMCs. So in that case, you have to test against especially carbapenemases because carbapenemases will clearly hydrolyze ceftalosone tazobacta. So it's a very good antibiotic, but you have to rule out carbapenemases. Next one, please. So in summary, bacterial resistance by ESBLs and carbapenemases in Latin America is a growing threat. Knowledge of successful plasmid and clones will help raise individual strategies for which we need rapid molecular diagnostic and genomic sequencing. In the case of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the resistance to carbapenems is multifactorial, selective pressure due to an increase in the use of and dissemination of plasmids. The impact of COVID-19 on bacterial and fungal co-infections is not yet known, but knowing the local epidemiology is key for the appropriate use of antibiotics. You should use the antibiotic according to your own hospital epidemiology. ESBOs and carbapenemases will play a very important role in Latin America, and for that, antimicrobial stewardship programs associated with an excellent infection prevention and control program is the most important strategy to limit their spread. Next one, next. And thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Dr. Vijegas, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, for those of you that have joined us, uh, she just presented quite an overview of the epidemiology of multi-drug resistant bacteria in Latin America and discussed some of the strategies. And we'll, we'll get more into, as the slide is suggesting for questions, uh, they will be at the end of the presentation, at the end of Dr. Costa's presentation, and I'm about to introduce her. Please submit your questions via the chat box or through the question box, because we will have 10 to 15 minutes for you to engage with them on this very important topic. Um, as you've noticed, Dr. Vajaja also just presented some recently published data from August showing the spread of multidrug resistant bacteria in the region. With that, I'd like to advance to the next slide. And welcome, Dr. Sylvia Costa, Associate Professor in the Department of Infectious Diseases at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Her part of this webinar, she'll be discussing stewardship during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Costa, I'd like to welcome you to the presentation and I'll turn it over to you. Yes, so um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, together with Dr. Patterson and Professor Vijegas and the Boa Noite. Buenas noches, good night. So uh, I will talk a little bit about stewardship during the COVID-19 pandemic. The impact of COVID-19 on healthcare associated infection, antibiotic res resistance, and uh, strategy to improve the antimicrobial stewardship problems, such as the use of biomarkers as procalcitonin, PCT, as tool to guide antibiotics. Next, please. So in this um, manuscript, they compare the impact of COVID-19 and antibiotic resistance as the number of um, uh, people affected by uh, those disease in fact, on mortality that you can see that is higher uh, among patients that develop antibiotic resistance infections and the de development of the vaccine that um, and we know that up to now have at least six potential vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 and no vaccine at all against antibiotic resistance uh, microorganisms. And the rapid diagnostic that um, had been developed uh, during the pandemic uh, targeting uh, SARS-CoV-2 and few uh, tools to diagnose antibiotic resistance uh, uh, bugs and also to guide the antibiotic use 
such as PCT and C reactive protein. Next, please. So this study was um, done in China and evaluated the etiology and antimicrobial resistance of secondary bacterial infections and patients hospitalized with COVID-19 in Wuhan. It was a retrospective analysis. Next, please. And they compared uh, and the patients and classified the patients in two groups. Uh, 102 patients were evaluated and they are class classified in severe group and uh, critical group. And they, this table shows the demographic and clinical data regarding the patients and the etiology of the secondary infection. And it was um, caused mostly by very negative bacteria, such as Acinetobacter, responsible for 58% uh, of infections in the uh, critical group, being in around 50% resistant to carbapenem, and uh, followed by Klebsiella pneumonia, uh, that uh, well, uh, was 42% of the infections in the critical group being around 39% uh, uh, resistant to carbapenem. Next, please. They also um, evaluated the type of infection and most of the negative bacteria caused uh, pneumonia and Acinetobacter, Klebsiella, and Stenotrophomonas were the most frequent agents of pneumonia. And the gram positive was more uh, related to bloodstream infection. And the Staphylococcus and the Staphylococcus epidermis were the most frequent cause of bloodstream infection uh, in this study. Next, please. So in this um, review, they report and data regarding healthcare associated infection all over the world. And uh, 13 studies uh, were done in China. And um, the proportion of patients on mechanical ventilation varied from 2.3 to 42 percent, super infection from 5 to 15 percent, and antibiotic use from 15 to 100 percent. The most frequent agents cause infection were Acinetobacter, Klebsiella, ESBL, and KFC, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and um, fungi such as Candida causing blood seed infection and Aspergillus causing pneumonia. One of the most interesting uh, reporting this review was this study that involved more than 500 hospitals of, of 30 cities and 1,000 patients, and of them 5% intensive care units, and showed that 59% of patients were on use of antibiotic. And data from three hospitals showed that 27% of infections were caused by ground positive. Next, please. They also report data from Europe and the United States of America. And this uh, study um, performing three uh, hospitals showed that uh, um, pneumonia wa was frequently caused by Acinetobacter baumani and Aspergillus flavus. And this uh, study from the United States showed that uh, um, in patients with COVID-19, so the originosa was a frequent cause of blood cell infection. Next, please. This Italian study was very important because they compared the incidence of CRE accession in 2019 and now during the COVID-19 pandemic, and then showed that they had an impressive increase of the rates of CRE acquisition from 6.7 from uh, 2019 to 50% during the pandemic. The graph shows 
the part on uh, blue, the acquisition and colonization by CRE. And uh, up to the beginning of this year was around 5%. And during March and April, uh, raised to 50%. Next, please. And then they compared also the, the proportion of patient colonizing and uh, the user prime positions. 67% of the patients that had been changed in poster with prime position were colonized by CRE, compared with only 37% of patients that had not been changed in poster. And they also showed that the prone position required in four to five healthcare works equipped with personal protective equipment, stand and prolong, prolong the contact with the patients, and they, that they need help during the pandemic. The presence of 32 new healthcare works from other departments and without work experience and intensive care set. So shame showing that the intensive care units are high intensive uh, care and so with a high risk area to develop um, infection caused by um, multi resistance bacteria and CRE. Next, please. Next, please. And I will show, show data from um, Brazilian hospitals. It's a uh, study that um, um, had been conducted here and involved 11 Brazilian hospitals from different states in Brazil. And we are comparing um, rates of blood stream infection, ventilator associated pneumonia, and rates of antibiotic resistance at, at between uh, 2019 and 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we observed an um, increase of rates of ventilator associated pneumonia during the pandemic, increased number of stenotrophomonas, acinetobacter, and pseudomonas and, uh, infections, mainly uh, pneumonia, and the increase of rates of pandemic. Um, brought in infection caused by Canada during the pandemic. Next, please. But even though uh, most of the, the, the hospitals um, showed the increase in of rates of ventilators to save pneumonia, only few hospitals, uh, the, the rate was um, statistically significant. As you can see here, I will show an example. Um, my hospital in Sao Paulo that increasing the rate of ventilator associated pneumonia uh, that was in 2019 2.6 to 5.17 during the pandemic. So showing the uh, increase of rate of both blood infection and pneumonia. Next, please. In this study, they um, evaluate antibiotic stewardship problems using Twitter. And they ask the infectious disease and antibiotic stewardship communities whether the antibiotic stewardship problems at their health systems had been involved in SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 outbreak response or preparation. Next, please. And they show interesting data. 254 um, responses they received. 30% notes direct involvement, 28 indicated in indirect involvement, and 39 indicated no involvement at all. Next, please. So then they are uh, devising uh, points uh, that we can reinforce to improve the strategy of antibiotic stewardship problems at our hospitals. They point out, point out, point out, point out that um, 
collaboration and the epidemiological interaction problem, it's an important point. That we know to, um, a stewardship and try to improve on the time frame between um, PCR and the, the results regarding SARS-CoV-2 and treatment was the most important point, uh, such as have uh, the data available, uh, the um, help with an ERB and um, the addition to guidelines. Next, please. In this um, Spanish study, they evaluate both the rates of um, healthcare-associated infection and multidrug resistance blood stem infection, as well as the antibiotic consumption during the pandemic. They compared COVID-19 work with no COVID-19 works and they, uh, during 20 weeks, and they could uh, observe that between 16 to 20 weeks, of the pandemic, they, they um, had an um, amount of consumption to be higher in the COVID-19 wards compared with no COVID-19 wards. Next, please. So, this important manuscript will advise us how to improve the and microbial stewardship at our hospital. Step by step. Step one, antibiotics should be reserved for the patients with the most severe presentation. Step two, if antibiotics are started, microbiological tests should be obtained before. Step three, antibiotic treatment should be rapidly re-evaluated and stopped as soon as possible. Next, please. Step five, if antibiotic treatment is continuated, an oral switch should be performed rapidly if the patient is able to take oral medication. Step six, antibiotic treatment duration should not exceed five days in most cases. Step seven, if antibiotic are considering a bad lactam providing coverage for septopox pneumonia and MRSA should be the first option. Next. Step nine, for patients in intensive care units requiring mechanic ventilation, standard measure to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia and other healthcare-associated infections should be implemented. Step 10, an adopted data about the impact of atomizing on SARS-CoV-2 so, viral load does not justify the routine administration of these antibiotics. Next, please. And last but not least, antibiotics should not be given prophylactically to prevent bacterial pneumonia. Use of SBD um, may be an exception in case you can use it to where it has been already done. Next, please. So I will share data from here, from Sao Paulo, my hospital, that is the Hospital das Clínicas. It's a public high complex uh, university hospital comprised five buildings with 2,000 beds. Next, please. And 22,000 healthcare works. And we are a reference hospital um, to COVID-19 in the city of Sao Paulo, with a building dedicated only to COVID-19. This building has 900 beds and around 300 intensive care unit beds. Next, please. So, as a reference hospital, we are receiving patients from several hospitals in Sao Paulo and, and also from four field campion hospitals at the city of Sao Paulo. This photo is showing one of these hospitals in the very famous station, soccer station in Sao Paulo, uh, where Pelé, one of the most uh, famous soccer 
player in the world uh, played several times. In this other photo is a photo of our intensive care unit. Next, please. And so we try to improve our stewardship during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we decided to use Procostanin as a biomarker to help us to guide antibiotic using stop antibiotic in, and patients with ventilator sustained pneumonia. And this table uh, presents data, demographic and clinical data, and shows that uh, PCT was higher in patients with ventilator associated pneumonia compared with patients with no ventilator associated pneumonia, and, and CRP was not. And the most frequent agent that caused pneumonia, I mean, related to say pneumonia at our hospital, uh, were Cabezella, Cimetobacter, and Pseudomonas. Next, please. And then um, PCT was also helpful to stop the use of antibiotic. In 13% of the cases, it could stop based on the PCT level. The most frequent antibiotic used at our intensive care units were meropenem, vancomycin, and piperacin and tazobactam. Next, please. So, I'd like to finish my presentation with a take home message regarding uh, the RP stewardship problem during the COVID 19 pandemic. As a professor of Ichega showed it, and I also showed some studies that um, point, point out that um, healthcare uh, work from associated infection increases, many caused by gram negative during the pandemic. And um, both of centers and also um, reported the increase of tabacanin resistant infection during the pandemic. We should uh, improve our stewardship and focus on some points that we'd like to reinforce that are focus on diagnostic, no antibiotic prophylaxis, stop antibiotic in five days, and de escalation based on results. So, combat drug resistance means no action today, no cure tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Costa, for that very interesting overview and pro providing you with some of the changes and things that are happening in, during the COVID pandemic around the world, as well as in Latin America. Perfect timing. We have 10 minutes. We have 11 minutes for questions to both of our speakers this evening. Please, uh, for those of you that are participating in our webinar, there are hundreds of you, please submit your questions via the chat box or via the question box. Um, I'll, I'll kick it off with Dr. Vijegas. Um, you presented quite, um, you know, the epidemiology is quite significant for um, carbapenem resistance in Latin America. Before the COVID pandemic, um, I'm curious, was is the resistance mostly predominating in a hospital setting? hospital associated, or is it also coming in from the community? Yeah, for carbapenem resistant enterobacteracia, and when you just uh, make the right diagnosis that is a carbapenemase producer enterobacteria, always in the hospital. We have not been able to report really that it's, it's, it's the origin is the community. Most of the, the times the patient has been previously hospitalized, but remember that a patient that is colonized in the GI tract may persist with the KPC for one year. So that's very interesting. That's why you can you may lose track that the patient was previously hospitalized or in a healthcare institution, because if that patient is treated, goes home, stays home one year and comes back, if you do a rectal swab, you may still find a KPC there, which is really astonishing. So ESBLs are more in the community. If you think about E. coli with CTXM, Plexelas mainly in the hospitals with ESBOs, 
but CRE is mainly in the hospital. Thank you for clarifying that with your presentation. Um, just as a quick follow on to that, Dr. Vijayas, when, uh, and then maybe Dr. Costa can answer this as well. Um, because of the high prevalence of the resistance, are, do you usually wait for a diagnostic assay to tell you the resistance profile, or are you empirically treating for carbapenemase resistance for somebody that you suspect in the hospital, you know, they've acquired an infection while in the hospital? And I'll go to Dr. Vijegas first and then ask Dr. Costa. Yeah, that's a very good question because it will depend on your hospital epidemiology. I have hospitals that I support that listen to these. 70% of Eclipsielas are carbapenem resistance. And that's the number one bacteria in the ICU. And then from the blood source, we have found that also in bacteremia, 60% are KPCs. So if that patient is in that ICU and he has an infection, a severe infection that I cannot wait, for sure, I will cover carbapenemases. Instead, if the patient is very stable, is a urinary tract infection, non-complicated, I may wait for the result. Dr. Costa, the yes, approach uh, in your hospital. Yes, I totally agree with Professor Vichegas, but I, I can, I'd like to add an information. We are right now performing also, uh, I studied that we are using um, array sepsis that can detect on blood um, the bacteria and also a couple of resistance genes. So you are trying to not use uh, a lot of empirical treatments just based on the epidemiological data. We're trying to add more information using uh, biomarkers and also PCR and all kinds of uh, new tools that can help us to try to not use too much antibiotic. But it's true, if the patient is a severe patient with the sepsis, for example, most of the intensive care units will add a coverage of a carbapenem resistance, such as our polymexin or a new drug. Yeah. yeah, molecular tools are key. The problem is that many hospitals cannot use them, but of course, it's the perfect way of just using the right antibiotic for the right bacteria with the right mechanism of resistance. Totally right. Uh, the, the, my next question is for Dr. Costa, just as a follow on to some of the slides you presented at the end about the use of procalcitonin with COVID and um, trying to differentiate whether there's a pneumonia viral versus bacterial, uh, are, are you, is the team there using more of that biomarker to guide whether to use antibiotics or not? Has that, has that changed things somewhat, the pandemic? Yes, at least at our hospital, yes. So um, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we didn't have an available PCT at our hospital because it's a public hospital. Uh, PCT is available in many private hospitals in Brazil, but in few public hospitals. I don't know about Colombia and other uh, Latin American countries. But because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the hospital decided to uh, have an available PCT and it was very, very useful because it could stop uh, around 13% of antibiotic use in, in our intensive care units. And since then, now I have now available PCT not only for intensive care units, but also for the entire hospital. And uh, yes, it will be very useful. Thank you. We've got some questions coming in and thank you to those of us, those of you that are staying on tonight. Um, both of you need to answer this one. With, with COVID pandemic and the, the clinicians trying to understand how to treat them, there's no pneumonia guidelines, um, people coming in from the community and they have a question around um, when, when they're coming in through the emergency room, are they initially, initially started on antibiotics or not? Are you waiting for a diagnostic result that may take 24 hours? I, I think they're feeling conflicted because during COVID there's the suggestion not to use prophylactic antibiotics, yet they're kind of stuck in this conundrum. So they want your guidance or your, or your opinion on this one. 
Well, I would say guidance, little, because nobody knows really exactly. I mean, it's more your clinical judgment, really. But what I see is they're starting antibiotics almost from the beginning. Hopefully, if they do so, let's start with a very narrow spectrum, like ampicillin sulfactan plus peritomycin, if they want to do that. Thinking, because this is different as influenza. I don't know if Sylvia has the same feeling. This is not like influenza when people with influenza came, for sure. You have to cover most of the time staph aureus, not in this case. Actually, if they have an pneumonia, it's from the community, strep pneumo, whatever. Hopefully, they will have a quick diagnosis of COVID. And if the patient is stable, I would say don't use antibiotics because that patient lately, probably, if he stays for a long time in the hospital, he's going to get infected and he's going to have a nosocomial pneumonia. Dr. Costa. So I think that if it's possible to uh, use, for example, um, inspiratory pineal, such as uh, multiplex that you target both bacteria and virus, then uh, you you feel more comfortable to not give antibiotic, and you have uh, all the results uh, as faster as possible. For example, at our hospital, uh, you need at least 12 hours to have the um, uh, um, PCR results for SARS-CoV-2, but we are doing right now uh, another project that we are testing uh, both bacteria and uh, big virus using a respiratory pineal, then uh, can give us the results in one hour, then we will assure that the patient does not have an, uh, a co-infection, for example, because the, 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 the problem is the patient has symptoms of COVID-19, but 20% uh, of patients can have co-infection by bacteria. And because of that, uh, most of the hospitals, they are given antibiotic for all patients. So again, we need to target on a good uh, diagnosis to, to not give antibiotics. All right, I'd like to transition to talking a little bit more about uh, antimicrobial stewardship. And um, in speaking with some clinicians in the US, there during the COVID pandemic, and, and, and Dr. Costa, you touched on this, where the antimicrobial stewardship teams got involved in responsiveness, emergency responsiveness. And there was concern that from some of them, they were adapting and repurposing themselves. but now, as we've, maybe some of the antimicrobial stewardship programs even were, you know, priorities had switched. Now we're coming back, we're still dealing with a lot of things, but trying to now learn from that and reestablish some of these programs. I'm wondering um, two things from each of you. What is your primary concern right now as it relates to antibiotic resistance now during having gone through and still in the COVID pandemic? That's my first question. Dr. Vujegas? Yeah, I think we're gonna have a really, I mean, big rise in antimicrobial resistance. And the fact is because you're putting a lot of selective pressures from the very beginning. So actually some hospitals move very fast into meropenem or piperacillin and tazobactam. So they don't start with very narrow and wait and see the changes. They just go from the beginning with very broad spectrum antibiotics. And of course, when you do that and the patient stays in your hospital for two weeks in the ICU, you have to expect bacteria resistant to that antibiotic. So remember, that's one of my the things that I say, when whatever you don't kill, you select. And so the mm -hmm. one that has all the mechanisms of resistance to survive to any antibiotic you use. So at the end, you're gonna be selecting a population of multidrug resistance of the mona, which is, the one who is going to produce the nosocomial pneumonia because it comes from your gut. I mean, 60% of your nosocomial infections are coming from your own flora. So if you leave the patient colonized with a multidrug resistant bacteria, ISBO, pseudomonas, KPC, that's what is going to infect the patient later. Dr. Costa, your, your number one concern right now. My number one concern, um, in fact, Two um, bugs, Acinetobacter, because most of, at least in Brazil, most of the hospitals, 
they were very worried about KPC, but you know, it's an increase of number of acinetobacter and stenotrophomonas as well. Because uh, I think that uh, they are using a lot of carbapenem, and uh, stenotrophomonas is intrinsically resistant to carbapenem. So we note outbreaks of stenotrophomonas in many hospitals here in Sao Paulo and Brazil. And um, I was very surprised that I, I was worried about MRSA, and uh, it increased also, uh, but not as much as the cinetobacter and the stenotrophomonas. Interesting. So both increasing resistance, but perhaps depending on your hospital, or, or as you pointed out, your geographical area, different concerns. Exactly. And in that case, for example, we don't have a cinetobacter. As we don't have, that's an infection control problem. So if you don't have a cinetobacter, we, know, we don't see any acinobacter causing infections in COVID patients or in any other patient. But if that's topping your list, you will see it. Stenotropomona mm -hmm. is because of the selective pressure. Stenotropomona has the gene as metalobeta-lactamases. So it's by definition intrinsically resistant to every beta-lactam. So if you're giving a beta-lactam, what you expect is something resistant to your treatment. So then you have stenotropomonas, which is absolutely true. Dr. Vajegas, are you still continuing to collect your data on epidemiology with your collaborators? And I assume a follow-up publication will be coming? Hopefully. We'll see yeah. what happens in this semester compared to the last semester before the COVID uh, started, yes. All right, I have a, a final. I'm, I'm going to check to see any more questions from some additional questions from our audience. And then I'll move on to um, ah, Dr. Costa. This is one that that, that um, someone has asked you uh, specifically about procalcitonin. Um, and we, we touched on this already that you said that it's starting to be used increasingly as you try to differentiate between COVID and um, uh, non-COVID patients from the ventilator. Do you, do you see that you'll continue to use that going forward? since you've noted that you're able to use it, it, it to integrate it with your antimicrobial stewardship practices? Yes, I, I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, we are continuing to use as a tool to improve our uh, antimicrobial stewardship problem. Yes, because in fact, and the uh, intensive care physicians, they would like to use it to stop the antibiotic use. So it was a, an, an effort of infectious disease clinicians and the infection control team together with the uh, intensive care unit uh, physicians as well. So, yes. You both mentioned very much the importance of infection control. Most have mentioned the importance of infection control, with, you know, working with you with your antimicrobial stewardship, as well as the importance of diagnostics. So I think that's a good thing to point out as well, is that we're we're not siloed here, we're working all in collaboration. So my final question to you, and I'll start with Dr. Costa this time, um, where, where are you primarily focused now? If there's the one thing that you feel related to antimicrobial stewardship or control, what's what's like the number one priority on, on your list this this week that you're focused on? Yes. <laughs> the, um, right now, we are focused more in trying to answer a couple of questions, such as the importance of co-infection and try to um, improve the um, stewardship at our hospital and also to decrease the number of um, infection caused by um, resistance bugs as well in our intensive care unit. And uh, we are very worried because it seems that second wave is coming and we have a lot of increase of the number of cases uh, in Brazil and we are preparing for the second wave. So we are opening now new uh, intensive care beds and new uh, um, ward beds uh, to COVID-19 at my hospital in, in several uh, private hospitals in, hospitals in Brazil. So very much engaged in preparedness. 
And, and, yes. and yes. Dr. Vijegas, would you like to finish with your answer? I'm an antimicrobial stewardship person, but I would say infection control. And the reason is because we are seeing an increase of hospital acquired infections. And the reason is because these patients are really sick, are prone. So we have a lot of catheter related infections because it's very difficult to clean the catheters. Mm -hmm. We're seeing mm -hmm. diarrhea. So you see a lot of polycatheters infections causing urinary tract infections. And the, and, the, and the doctors are and the nurses are so worried about the COVID that sometimes they are protecting themselves, but are forgetting about the patient because they are all with all these things, but they are not changing the gloves, they are not changing uh, what the gowns, they are doing things, so they are transmitting sometimes other bacteria from one patient to the other one, just because they are so protected. So I'm very worried about infection control because it's very important uh, also to protect the patient, the COVID patient, the healthcare workers, and the patient per se is having an increased possibility of hospital acquired infections. Thank you so much, both of you. Unfortunately, we are out of time tonight. Yes. And I just want to thank you both. You did this uh, in the middle of all your busy day, your busy weeks, uh, preparing for this webinar together, bringing us the perspective of Latin America, which absolutely needed to be discussed on this global platform to educate everyone and your colleagues in Latin America that have joined us. I just wanted to thank you both so much and appreciate this. I wanna let everyone know that's still on with us. This has been recorded and will be available. And um, actually I need to also make sure I've advanced the slide to give you guys the final code as well. So for those of you still on with us, hopefully um, that's most of you, by December 25th, you'll need this code for VJ, R Y G. That's your attendance code to go in and take your post test assessment and to receive your continuing education credit. And again, it'll be recorded so you will be able to rewatch this. You'll be able to share it with all your colleagues. And um, Dr. Vijegas and Dr. Costa, we've had many comments. Thank you so much for your excellent pre presentation tonight. So we all appreciate you tonight. Thank you, Marty. Sylvia, it was a pleasure. Have a great thank night you. and thank you very much. Thank Bye. you, Dr. Thank Preston. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you.